Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard. Today I turn the camera over to you, the Hollywood Graveyard community, as we travel the world to visit famous and historical graves in your neck of the woods. Today we're visiting Ireland and the United Kingdom to find legends like Sinead O'Connor, George Michael, Richard III, Arthur Guinness, and many more. My friends, the time is yours. Continuing round three of our famous Grave Tour series filmed by you, today we get to spend more time in those enchanted churchyards, cemeteries, and cathedrals that dot the landscapes across Ireland and the United Kingdom. We've spent a lot of time here in the past, so if you haven't done so already, be sure to check out our playlist of videos covering the cemeteries of Ireland and the UK. Let's begin today on the beautiful Emerald Isle. Our first Ireland stop is Dean's Grange Cemetery in Dublin. Here we find the grave of Sinead O'Connor. She was one of the most prominent singer-songwriters to come out of Ireland. She rose to fame in the 80s and 90s with albums like The Lion and the Cobra and I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got, which featured her international hit Nothing Compares to You. The song was written and originally performed by Prince, but it has since become her signature song and was honored as the top world single of the year at the Billboard Music Awards. Other notable hits include Mandinka, her strong and unique vocals were complemented by her distinctive look, embodying non-conformity with a shaved head. She was also a vocal advocate for women's rights and drawing attention to issues like child abuse. Later in life she converted to Islam. In July 2023 Sinead O'Connor was found unresponsive in her London flat. She passed away at just 56 from what was determined to be natural causes. Also here at Dean's Grange is Dermot Morgan. He was an actor and comedian best remembered for his role as the title character in the 90s sitcom Father Ted. The role earned him a BAFTA for Best Comedy Performance. He's also known for creating and performing in the sketch comedy radio show Scrap Saturday. The day after recording the series finale for Father Ted, Morgan suffered a fatal heart attack while hosting a dinner party. He was just 45. This is the grave of distinguished Irish actor of stage, screen, and television, Noel Purcell. With his magnificent beard, he's particularly known for high seas adventure films like Mutiny on the Bounty, The Crimson Pirate, and Moby Dick. He was also a regular in the British TV series The Buccaneers. Noel spent his early career on the Dublin stage, and his grave here features a brick from the Theatre Royal in Dublin. He lived to be 84. Next up is William Shields, known professionally as Barry Fitzgerald. He was the brother of Arthur Shields, also resting here, who we visited previously. Barry was another of the great character actors to come out of Ireland. He appeared in more than 50 film and television roles over his career, winning an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for his role as Father Fitzgibbon in the 1944 film Going My Way. He was also nominated for Best Lead Actor for the same character. Other notable films include The Quiet Man, Bringing Up Baby, and How Green Was My Valley. Barry was a favorite of director John Ford and appeared in many of his films. He died after suffering a heart attack at age 72. This distinctive monument commemorates John McCormick, also known as the Count McCormick. He was an Irish tenor known for performances of both operatic and popular songs. He'd become one of the most popular singers of the early 20th century, known as the Voice of Ireland. He made a number of successful recordings during the World War I era, including Keep the Home Fires Burning, and was the first artist to record It's a Long Way to Tipperary. It's a long way to Tipperary, but my heart right there. He also appeared in a few films in the 30s, like Song of My Heart and Wings of the Morning. He died at age 61 from influenza and pneumonia. One of the grandest and most famous cemeteries in Ireland is Glasnevin here in Dublin, home to many notables we've visited in previous videos. Resting among them is Maud Gaughan. She was an activist and actress. 
Known as the Irish Joan of Arc, the tall, rebellious, red-headed beauty fought and advocated for Irish independence in the late 1800s, early 1900s. She would see this dream partially realized when much of Ireland gained independence from the UK in 1922, though her efforts landed her in prison several times. Her powerful speeches and stage presence served her well in the theatre, acting in plays, including the lead in the play Kathleen Nihoulihan by W.B. Yeats. Maud was Yeats's longtime lover and muse, many of his poems written for or about her. They never married, Maud insisting that his unrequited love inspired his best poetry. Maud Gon passed away in 1953 at age 86. Our next stop is Mount Venus in Dublin. Here's the niche of another legendary Irish actor, star of film, television, and the stage, David Kelly. He's shown in comedic roles, like Michael in Waking Ned Divine, and Grandpa Joe in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Yippee! And in his younger years, you saw him as Albert on the sitcom Robin's Nest, and as inept builder O'Reilly on Faulty Towers. Could you please take your tools back and continue with the work? Well, I caught in view of what Mrs. Fault she was saying. You're I'm not going to take that seriously, are you? Well, I thought I might. David also had a notable career on stage for decades, including his Helen Hayes award-winning performance in The Playboy of the Western World. David Kelly passed away at age 82, the Irish Times remembering him as the grand old man of Irish acting. Let's follow Arthur's way to find the tomb of a man whose name has become synonymous with Irish stout. And if you like your beer as dark as my last name, you likely know who we're headed to visit. We find ourselves now among the ancient ruins of Uchterard Church. Here in the adjoining vault are deposited the mortal remains of Arthur Guinness. He purchased his first brewery outside of Dublin in 1755. He worked to produce high quality, low alcohol beer that was safer to drink than contaminated water of that era. A few years later in 1759, he moved his brewery into Dublin. A savvy businessman, he signed a 9,000 year lease at 45 pounds a year for the iconic St. James's Gate Brewery. Guinness produced ale, but in the decades that followed, shifted his focus to the dark porter that would become synonymous with Guinness. Centuries later, Guinness remains one of the most popular and recognized alcohol brands worldwide. Arthur Guinness used his success to give back to the community, and the company would pioneer employee benefits and welfare with higher wages, free health care, paid holidays, subsidized meals, and pensions, seemingly commonplace today but all very novel centuries ago. Guinness believed that a happy workforce produced a better beer. Arthur died in 1803 at age 77, and the company was carried on by his son. Hard to leave this enchanted land behind, but it's time to move on to Ireland's neighbor to the north, Northern Ireland. This is Milltown Cemetery in Belfast, where we find the grave of Albert Sharp. He was an actor best remembered for his role as Darby O'Gill in the Disney classic Darby O'Gill and the Little People, which also starred a young Sean Connery. And my third wish is for the crock of gold. Grant it. Other notable films include Brigadoon and Royal Wedding. He also starred in the original Broadway production of Finian's Rainbow. He died in Belfast at the age of 84. Also here in Milltown is a funny man with a distinctive tombstone named Frank Carson. He rose to prominence as a stand-up comedian in the UK and also as a comic on Irish television. He'd become a familiar face across televisions in Ireland and the UK, making numerous appearances on shows like The Comedians, Celebrity Squares, Tis Was, and This Is Your Life. His catchphrases are inscribed right here on his tombstone, it's a cracker, and it's the way I tell them. Frank died from complications of stomach cancer at age 85. Next up is Belfast City Cemetery. Here lies Rinty Monaghan. He was a world flyweight champion boxer from Belfast. He became known in the post-war period, becoming a hero and inspiration for his home country in 1948 when he became undisputed champion of the world. He retired undefeated a few years later with a total of 52 wins. 
Rinty died from lung cancer at age 65. In the Irish Sea between Great Britain and Ireland is the Isle of Man. It's a British Crown dependency but isn't actually a part of the United Kingdom. This is St. Bridget Churchyard in the city of Bride. Here lies a man remembered with a laugh, Sir Norman Wisdom. He was an actor who became known as a great British clown, making numerous popular comedy films in the 50s and 60s. He won a BAFTA award in 1953 as most promising newcomer for the film Trouble in Store. He'd go on to star in a series of films featuring his on-screen grump character Norman Pitkin. He also co-wrote many of these films. Norman would make films in Hollywood too, like The Night They Raided Minsky's. Later he had a prominent career on Broadway and on television, including a critically acclaimed performance in the television play Going Gently. He passed at the age of 95 after a series of strokes. The hat here on his stone is similar to one he would wear on screen. Turning north, let's visit Scotland once again. This is Dunfermline Abbey in Fife and the grave of St. Margaret of Scotland. The English princess and Scottish queen was sometimes called the Pearl of Scotland. She married King Malcolm III of Scotland, making her queen in 1070. Margaret was incredibly pious in her faith and dedicated herself to charitable causes serving orphans and the poor. She died around the age of 48 from apparent grief from the death of her husband and son. In 1250, Margaret would be canonized, a patron saint of the poor. Part of St. Margaret's remains are here, but her head was kept as a relic by Mary Queen of Scots. For good luck, it was later lost. Heading into the Abbey, we find the regal grave of Robert the Bruce. He was King of Scots from 1306 until his death in 1329. Robert led Scotland during the first war of Scottish independence against England. He fought successfully during his reign to restore Scotland to an independent kingdom in 1314, and is considered a national hero in Scotland. King Robert died at just 54 from unknown causes and was laid to rest here under this high altar. Though most of him is here, it was his dying wish that his heart be removed and buried in the Holy Land. His heart was removed, but it never made it there, and was eventually buried at Melrose Abbey. His original epitaph read, Here lies the invincible blessed King Robert. Whoever reads about his feats will repeat the many battles he fought. By his integrity he guided to liberty the kingdom of the Scots. May he live now in heaven. Robert the Bruce has been portrayed in fiction and on screen numerous times, including the 2018 film Outlaw King starring Chris Pine. How about this magnificent view from the Isle of Skye in Scotland? A view enjoyed in eternity by Alexander McQueen. He was a fashion designer who founded his own fashion label Alexander McQueen in 1992. He'd go on to be named Britain's Designer of the Year four times. Alexander was also a chief designer at Givenchy. His designs explored themes such as romanticism, sexuality, and death, with unique collection names such as Jack the Ripper Stalks His Victims and The Girl Who Lived in a Tree. His collections available in countries all over the world. During his career, McQueen created custom designs for music icons like David Bowie, Bjork, Lady Gaga, and Janet Jackson. But in February 2010, Alexander was found dead in his apartment at the age of 40. He had hanged himself. His epitaph reads, Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind. Continuing our journey across Great Britain, we arrive now in Wales. This is St. Martin's Churchyard in Larne. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. The wise men at their end no dark is right. Because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. These immortal words of fighting off death, of living life to the fullest until the very last breath, were written by noted Welsh writer Dylan Thomas. His best known works include that poem, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. Another of his noted poems also touches on the subject of death and is fitting for our travels today. And death shall have no dominion. Dead men, naked, they shall be one with the men of the wind and the west moon. When their bones are picked clean and the clean bones gone, they shall have scars at elbow and foot. Though they go mad, they shall be 
stain. Though they sink through the sea, they shall rise again. Though lovers be lost, love shall not, and death shall have no dominion. Dylan Thomas also wrote plays and stories for radio broadcasts like Under Milk Wood and A Child's Christmas in Wales. His writing shed on the riverbanks outside of Swansea can be visited today. But while on a trip to New York in 1953, Thomas became gravely ill and fell into a coma, passing away a short time later at just 39 from bronchitis and pneumonia. His body was returned to Wales and buried here. Moving into England now, what better way to begin here than by visiting a king? This is Leicester Cathedral. Herein we find the newly minted tomb of a centuries-old king, Richard III. Richard was king of England from 1483 until his death in 1485. He was the last king of the Plantagenet dynasty, which was replaced by the House of Tudor with Henry VII. Richard was proclaimed rightful king in 1483 after his 12-year-old nephew Edward V, who was to be crowned, was deemed illegitimate. Young Edward and his nine-year-old brother were sent to the Tower of London where they later disappeared, coming to be known as the Princes in the Tower. Their disappearance has often been attributed to Richard III in his attempts to secure the throne, though the full story remains a mystery. In 1485 Richard went to battle against Henry Tudor. Richard was slain, making him the last King of England to die in battle. His body was taken to Leicester and buried without ceremony. For more than 500 years, the location of Richard's grave was unknown, so a memorial stone was placed in the Leicester Cathedral. But in 2012, researchers at the University of Leicester and the Richard III Society began to hone in on an area they believed might be the burial place of Richard III, in a parking lot outside the cathedral, which was the former site of the Grey Friars Priory. On the very first day of the dig in the parking lot, researchers found skeletal remains. There was severe scoliosis of the spine, which Richard III was known to have. And after extensive evaluation of the remains, it was concluded that these were indeed the remains of Richard III. In 2015, his remains were carried in procession to the cathedral and reinterred here under this new tomb. Richard's life was dramatized in Shakespeare's play Richard III, which has also been adapted on screen numerous times. This is the Church of St. Mary Magdalene in Tanworth in Arden. In these grounds rests Nick Drake. He was a singer and songwriter of the 60s and 70s, known for his folk style music. He released three albums, Five Leaves Left, Brighter Later, and Pink Moon, with Pink Moon becoming one of his best-known songs. Pink Moon is on its way. But in the early morning hours of November 25, 1974, Nick took an overdose of antidepressants, passing away at just 26. Also here we find the grave of Mike Halewood, he was a motorcycle racer and race car driver, ranking among some of the all-time greats. He competed in the Grand Prix Motorcycle World Championships in the 50s and 60s, winning a total of nine. He'd go on to compete in Formula One and other car racing events, making him one of the few men to compete at Grand Prix levels in both motorcycle and car. But his life was cut short when he died in a car accident, not on the racetrack, but while traveling along the highway near his home. A truck performing an illegal U-turn pulled out in front of them. He was just 40. His nine-year-old daughter also perished in the crash and rests here alongside him. This charming vista is found at Lentwardine Cemetery in Herefordshire. Herein we find the grave of John Chalice. The beloved English actor is remembered for playing Boise on the long-running sitcom Only Fools and Horses and the subsequent spin-off, The Green Green Grass. He also played Monty on Benidorm and made appearances on shows like Doctor Who and Last of the Summer Wine. While known principally as a television actor, he did make a few movies as well and performed extensively in the theater, including in Richard III. John died from cancer in 2021 at age 79.
Another of England's iconic churchyards can be found at St. Peter's in East Sussex. This is the grave of a master storyteller named James Herbert. He was a horror author, penning numerous novels that have since become classics in the horror genre, like The Rats and The Fog. His books have sold more than 50 million copies worldwide and have been translated into multiple languages. Several of his books have been made into movies, including The Survivor and Shrine, as 2021's The Unholy. James passed away at age 69. His epitaph reads, Death is but the key. Also in East Sussex is Ocklinge Cemetery. Here we find a monument to Tommy Cooper, the tall fez-wearing comedic actor and magician toured the world performing his magical act featuring tricks that appeared to fail. His performances drew packed audiences at venues like the London Palladium. As his star rose, he moved into television with his own shows, Life with Cooper, Tommy Cooper, The Tommy Cooper Comedy Hour, and more. On this side of the pond, he'd appear numerous times on The Ed Sullivan Show. On April 15, Tommy was performing his act on live television. He collapsed from a heart attack in front of 12 million viewers. Audiences believed it was part of the act and continued to laugh as he lay dying on stage. The curtains were drawn and the show was cut to commercial, as Tommy was attended to. He was rushed to the hospital but died before they arrived. He was 63. Tommy was cremated, his ashes scattered in his garden over his daffodils. This cenotaph was later placed in his memory. This is Tintwistle Churchyard in Derbyshire. Resting in a quiet corner of the graveyard is Dame Vivian Westwood. She was another of Britain's great fashion designers. She's credited for helping bring punk and new wave fashions into the mainstream beginning in the 1970s. She rose to prominence designing clothes for her boutique with Malcolm McLaren called Let It Rock, later rebranded as Sex. Her designs would define the look of the punk movement of that era, including bands like the Sex Pistols. Vivian would expand into more shops, eventually growing throughout Britain and the world. She'd be named British Fashion Designer of the Year multiple times, and became a Dame of the Order of the British Empire in 1992. Her custom designs would be worn by stars like Duran Duran, Dita Von Teese, and Dua Lipa. Vivian passed away at age 81 in 2022. This is Southern Cemetery in Manchester. Here we find a man named Pickles, Wilfred Pickles. He was a radio presenter. Wilfred Pickles' career began as a newsreader on the radio during World War II. His unique Yorkshire accent was unusual on the airwaves, but intentional, as the accent would be much harder for Nazis to impersonate on the radio than the traditional RP accent of most BBC broadcasters. Perhaps his most significant work came after the war, hosting the popular radio show Have a Go from 1946 to 1967. His wife Mabel also appeared on the show and rests here next to him. Wilfred also starred in the TV series and subsequent movie adaptation of For the Love of Ada. He would be awarded the OBE for his services to broadcasting. Wilfred Pickles lived to be 73. In West Sussex is the Churchyard of St. Mary's. This is the final resting place of Alexandra Bastido. The British actress is known for her roles in secret agent films. She played Meg in Casino Royale, made appearances on The Saint, but is perhaps best remembered today for playing Sharon McCready in the 60s series The Champions. Other series include The Aphrodite Inheritance, and films include The Blood Splattered Bride and Batman Begins her final role. Alexandra died from breast cancer at age 67. Daffodils bloom in the churchyard around St. John the Evangelist Church in Lancashire. Herein we find a man named Keith Harris. He was a ventriloquist best known for his TV show The Keith Harris Show. On the show he performed alongside his best known creation, Orville the Green Duck, which is featured right here on his stone. He also performed with an orangutan named Cuddles. The show ran from 1982 to 1986. Keith and Orville appeared on numerous other shows as well, 
and also enjoyed success doing live performances on stage. The pair released a song together in 1982, which reached number four on the UK charts. In it, Orville sings that he wishes he could fly up to the sky. I wish I could fly up to the sky, but I can't. You can? I can't. Well, now he has, and Keith has gone with him, passing away from cancer at age 67. We now find ourselves at Carlton Cemetery in Blackpool. Here lies comedian Frank Randall. His comedy routines were edgy and mischievous for that era, leading him to be sometimes banned from performing, even arrested on obscenity charges. At the outbreak of the war, he began her career in film. He played Private Randall in the Somewhere In series of films in the 40s and 50s. The final installment was his final film, 1953's It's a Grand Life, alongside Diana Doors. Frank died from gastroenteritis at age 56. Also here at Carlton is the grave of an actor and comedian named Norman Evans. He's best remembered for his sketches and programs called Over the Garden Wall, in which he played Fanny Fairbottom, a toothless housewife gossiping over the garden wall. His tombstone here is made to resemble a garden wall, a nod to this famous skit. Norman would perform on radio, television, stage, and in film. He passed away at age 61, his epitaph here reading, his last garden wall. Our next Carlton stop brings us to the grave of Bernadette Nolan, known as Bernie. The Irish entertainer was the lead vocalist of the girl group The Nolans, popular in the 70s and 80s, with hits like I'm in the mood for dancing. She then moved into acting, playing Diane on the series Brookside, and Sergeant Murphy on The Bill in more than 100 episodes. She also made numerous appearances on television as herself on shows like The Games and On the Waterfront. Bernadette died from breast cancer at age 52. How about this magnificent church in Sussex? It's St. Mary's and St. Blaise Church where rests an American named Billy Fisk. In 1928 and 1932, Billy won gold as driver for the U.S. bobsledding team at the Winter Olympics. At the outbreak of World War II, he traveled to the UK to join the Royal Air Force Reserve. He claimed to be Canadian in order to enlist. Billy saw action in the Battle of Britain, but was killed on August 17, 1940. He was the first American-born citizen pilot killed in action during World War II. He was honored as an American citizen who died that England might live. He was 29. Thank you, Billy. Next up is St. Kentigern's Church in Cumberland. Mary Robinson was celebrated for her extraordinary beauty, known as the Maid of Buttermere. The girl of humble origins would be wooed by and wed to a handsome aristocrat, who turned out to be a scoundrel, a conman, and a bigamist. He would be hanged for his crimes, leaving Mary destitute. Her story captured the public imagination, and she would be mentioned in Wordsworth's poem, The Prelude. She would also be the subject of Melvin Bragg's novel The Maid of Buttermere, which was later made into a play. Mary died in 1837 having finally found love and contentedness as a farmer's wife. Also in these historic grounds is a man named John Peel. He was another British folk figure, known as the Huntsman. John Peel was a master of foxhounds who participated in the now banned sport of fox hunting. Remember Disney's The Fox and the Hound? John Peel became famous as the subject of the 19th century song, Do You Ken John Peel? Twas the sound of his horn brought me from my bed, and the cry of his hounds has me oft times led. For Peel's view Haloa would wake the dead, or a fox from his lair in the morning. John lived to be 78, his grave featuring hunting horns and his favorite dog. Rolling along through England's domains of the dead, we arrive at Dean Road Cemetery in Scarborough. Here we find a monument to a man named James Paul Moody. If you noted his death date, you have a good idea of his story. James was a British sailor who served as Titanic's sixth officer, the youngest officer on board. He was on watch on the bridge with other officers when Titanic struck the iceberg. Moody received the phone call from the crow's nest of an iceberg right ahead and relayed the message to First Officer Murdoch. 
As the ship sank, Moody helped in loading passengers into the lifeboats. He did not board one himself, but continued loading others until the ship sank. James Moody died at the age of 24. His body was never recovered. Welcome to the Church of St. Mary Magdalene in Bedfordshire. Here we find a woman whose story is somewhat similar to James Moody's, but with a different outcome. Meet Audrey Lawson Johnston. She was the last known survivor of the sinking of the RMS Lusitania, which was torpedoed by a German U-boat in 1915 and sank in just 18 minutes, claiming the lives of 1,959 people. Audrey was just three months old when she boarded the ship with her parents and her siblings on the fateful voyage. Baby Audrey was saved when her nursemaid acted quickly, taking her out of her cot and jumping into a lifeboat along with her brother. But although both her parents also survived, tragically her two elder sisters perished in the disaster. She never liked talking about the tragedy, but in later life Audrey became an active fundraiser for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. Audrey lived to be 95. This is Cheltenham Cemetery in Gloucestershire, and oh what a view it offers. We just don't get that here in Los Angeles. Here we find the grave of Dame Sidney Jane Brown. She was a British nurse known as the modern Florence Nightingale. She dedicated her life to nursing soldiers, serving in multiple campaigns including World War I. She was appointed Matron-in-Chief of Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service and subsequently Matron-in-Chief for the Territorial Force Nursing Service. She was responsible for the mobilization and expansion of this unit during the First World War. Then in 1916 she was actively involved in the creation of the Royal College of Nursing, becoming its inaugural president. Sydney lived to be 91. This is St. George's Church in Shropshire. In these grounds is a playwright, actor, and friend named John Osborne. He began his career in the theatre as a stage manager and actor before trying his hand at writing. He wrote a number of plays before his breakout success, the 1956 play Look Back in Anger. Other successful plays would follow, including The Entertainer and Luther, which won the Tony Award for Best Play. He also returned to acting in the 70s in films like Get Carter and Flash Gordon. And in 1974, John won the Oscar for Best Writing for an Adapted Screenplay for the film Tom Jones. He passed away from diabetes at age 65. Also here in Shropshire is Shrewsbury General Cemetery. Here lies Mary Webb. She was a poet and romance novelist of the early 20th century, whose work was usually set in the Shropshire countryside where she lived. She's perhaps best known for her 1917 novel Gone to Earth. It would be made into a Hollywood movie starring Jennifer Jones in 1950. Her novel Precious Bane was also adapted on screen. Mary was just 46 when she died, some of her unfinished work being published after her death. Not far from here we find the grave of Arthur Rowley. As noted right here on his stone, he was a record-breaking footballer, or soccer as we call it here. Arthur was known as the gunner for his explosive left foot. He holds the record for most goals in the history of English league football, scoring 434 goals over his career, between 1946 and 1965. Arthur lived to be 76. Moving on now we arrive at Fleetwood Cemetery in Fleetwood. Here lies an American soldier named Arthur Sinclair. He was an officer in the United States Navy until Virginia seceded from the Union. He then resigned from the United States Navy to join the Confederate Navy at the rank of commander. He helmed several ships in battles against the U.S. during the war. In 1864 he was serving in Paris when he was ordered to return home. He proceeded to Liverpool to find passage home. He came across a steamship and took command of the vessel, hoping to use it as a blockade runner in the war. The ship set out for North Carolina but hit bad weather and sank. Sinclair's body was discovered months later. He was buried here, making him the only known Civil War casualty buried outside the U.S. Welcome to Wilford Hill Cemetery in Nottingham. Here we find a star named Edwin Starr. He was a singer and songwriter, part of the Motown legacy of the 1970s. 
The song that launched his career is alluded to right here on his stone, Agent 00 Soul. Today he's best remembered for the Vietnam War protest song, War, which would become a number one hit. What is it good for? Absolutely. Now listen to me. Oh, oh. The song remains a powerful anthem against war and has been featured in numerous film and television productions. Starr was a hero of England's Northern Soul Circuit and would move to England in the 1980s. He died in 2003 from a heart attack at age 61. This is Rosary Cemetery in Norwich, and if you love spicy English mustard as much as I do, you'll get a kick out of this next one. Here lies Jeremiah Coleman. He is the Coleman in Coleman's Mustard, which he founded in Norfolk in 1814, purchasing a mill to crush mustard seeds. Coleman's distinctive flavor comes from a unique blend of white and brown mustard seeds, and has been called the Queen's Mustard. Coleman would also become mayor of Norwich in 1846. He died in 1851 at age 74. Our next stop is Friends Meeting House Quaker Burial Ground in Norfolk. Here we remember Anna Sewell. She was an English novelist who wrote the 1877 novel Black Beauty. It would be her only published work, but have a lasting legacy, becoming a bestseller. It was written in the final years of her life when she was ill and bedridden, passing away just months after its publication, but living long enough to see it become a success. Black Beauty has been adapted on screen more than a dozen times, including a recent Disney production starring Kate Winslet and Mackenzie Foy. Anna was 58 when she passed away. She was buried in the grounds of the Quaker Meeting House here, but in 1970 the house and grounds were sold privately, so the headstones were moved to the outer wall so they could be visited. Her burial place is just over the wall on the other side of the property. Next up is Norwich Cathedral. Here lies Edith Cavill. She was a British nurse celebrated for her work to save lives during the First World War, treating soldiers from both sides with no discrimination. She also helped hundreds of Allied soldiers and civilians escape German-occupied Belgium to safety in the Netherlands. In August 1915 she would be arrested by the Germans for harboring British and French soldiers. After ten weeks in prison, she was convicted and sentenced to death. Some of her final words were inscribed on her tombstone. I realize that patriotism is not enough. I must have no hatred or bitterness toward anyone. Edith was executed by a German firing squad on October 12, 1915, at the age of 49. The international outcry against the Germans for executing a nurse was fierce, and Edith Cavill became a heroic icon during the First World War. Her remains were returned to Britain after the war. Her body was transported by rail to Westminster Abbey where a state funeral was held for her. Greenacres Colony Woodland Burial Park is a green cemetery in Norfolk, which focuses on organic and eco-friendly funeral practices. In this tranquil locale we find the grave of Caroline Flack. She was an actress and television personality who rose to prominence in the early 2000s. She's best known for presenting numerous reality television shows of the era, like I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, The X Factor, and Love Island, which became the channel's most popular show once she came on as host. She also competed in and won BBC's Strictly Come Dancing in 2014. As an actress, Caroline appeared in shows like Bo Selecta, but Caroline struggled with mental health issues much of her life. In 2019, she was charged with assaulting her boyfriend, after which she stepped down from hosting Love Island. The tabloids and social media were ruthless to her, and a few months later Caroline was found dead in her flat at the age of 40. She had hanged herself. I made hay while the sun shone, my work sold. Now, if the harvest is over, and the world cold, give me the bonus of laughter as I lose hold. A quiet rural path in Trebetherick leads us into the churchyard of St. Enotic, where rests the man who wrote those words. In these grounds we find the grave of Sir John Betjeman. He was a poet and writer, becoming Poet Laureate of England from 1972 until his death. His work invoked feelings of nostalgia and was often humorous. 
John would also become a much-loved figure on British radio and television, and worked to preserve Victorian architecture across England. His writings made their way to the screen, including his autobiography Summoned by Bells. John suffered from Parkinson's later in life, passing away at age 77. His funeral was held at Westminster Abbey, and there is a monument to him in Poet's Corner. It's a rainy spring afternoon in Waltham Abbey. Here is the grave of David Rappaport. He was an actor who rose to popularity in the 70s and 80s. Born with a form of dwarfism, David stood 3 foot 11. He got his start in the theater before breaking into television. Perhaps his best known film role came in the form of Randall, the ringleader of a motley group of time-traveling thieves in 1981's Time Bandits. On television he had a recurring role as Simon on The Wizard and made appearances in shows like L.A. Law. But David struggled with depression later in life, passing away from a self-inflicted gunshot wound at the age of 38. We've arrived now at Chingford Mount Cemetery in London. Here we find the unmarked grave of Leslie Phillips, just behind the grave of his father here. Leslie was a well-loved comedic actor, appearing in the Carry On and Doctor in the House series of films. Later in life he took on more dramatic roles, including a BAFTA-nominated supporting role in 2006's Venus. And you fans of the Harry Potter films will recognize Leslie as the man who provided the voice for The Sorting Hat. And Slytherin will help you on the way to greatness, there's no doubt about that. No? Well, if you're sure, better be Gryffindor! Leslie lived to be 98, passing away in 2022. Also here is a pair of English gangsters, the Cray brothers, Ronnie and Reggie. The identical twin brothers were notorious organized crime figures in the 50s and 60s. They owned a nightclub where they started protection rackets, then expanded into hijacking, armed robbery, arson, extortion, and even murder. They rose to a sort of celebrity status. They were gangster chic, charming big stars in their nightclubs. But the brothers would eventually be arrested and imprisoned for their crimes. Ronnie was remitted to a mental hospital for the remainder of his life. Reggie was in prison until weeks before his death from cancer at age 66. They would be depicted in media, including a 2015 film starring Tom Hardy. This is All Saints Church in South London. Meet Vice Admiral Robert Fitzroy. He was an explorer, ship's captain, and naval officer. In the 1830s, he was captain of the HMS Beagle on its surveying voyage to South America. Aboard was Charles Darwin, whose findings in the Galapagos Islands on the voyage led to the theory of evolution. Robert was also a pioneering meteorologist, developing techniques used to forecast the weather and becoming the first head of the British Meteorological Office. Between 1843 and 1845, he was governor of New Zealand. His efforts focused on protecting the local Maori. In 1863, he was appointed to vice admiral in the British Navy. Robert Fitzroy died in 1865 at age 59. We've arrived now at Brompton Cemetery in London. Founded in 1849, it's one of London's magnificent seven cemeteries and is the only London cemetery to be Crown property. This is one of those cemeteries you can get lost in for hours, enjoying the beauty of it. It's also home to my spirit animal, a squirrel chilling on a tombstone. There are numerous notables here. The first we'll find features a statue of her likeness, Blanche Roosevelt. She was an American-born opera singer and writer popular in the latter half of the 19th century. She's remembered for originating the role of Mabel in the Gilbert and Sullivan opera The Pirates of Penzance on Broadway in 1879. She had made her operatic debut a few years earlier at the Royal Italian Opera House in Covent Garden, and went on to sing concerts throughout Europe. Later in life she had a successful career as an author and journalist, writing novels and biographies. 
but her life was cut tragically short while riding in a carriage in Monte Carlo. The carriage overturned when the horses bolted. She was severely injured, passing away from her injuries the following year at age 44. Next we head to the grave of Jon Snow. No, not that Jon Snow. This Jon Snow was a scientist, a pioneer in the fields of epidemiology and anesthesiology. In the 1840s he began experimenting with controlled doses of ether and chloroform as anesthesia during medical procedures. Queen Victoria herself asked Snow to administer anesthesia to her during the birth of two of her children. This led to wider acceptance of the procedure. Snow also made advances in the understanding of how diseases are spread. During the cholera outbreak of 1854, Snow undertook research efforts to understand the causes. He discounted the theory of foul air and traced the source to a water pump in Broad Street. When the well pump was removed, cholera cases immediately declined. John Snow died after suffering a stroke in 1858. He was 45. Our next Brompton stop is an actor named Ernest Thesiger. I'd hazard a guess that many of you out there are fans of classic horror. One of Ernest's best known roles is that of Dr. Pretorius in 1935's Bride of Frankenstein. The Bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> to a new world of gods and monsters. <laughs> He also appeared in another classic horror, The Dark Old House, in 1932. Or if Christmas is more your vibe, he played The Undertaker in 1951's A Christmas Carol. And Ernest also played Emperor Tiberius in The Robe. He made a few appearances on television later in his career before passing away in 1961 on the eve of his 82nd birthday. Engulfed in greenery is the grave of Fred Sullivan. He was an actor and singer during the Victorian era. He's known particularly for originating the role of the learned judge in Gilbert and Sullivan's comic opera, Trial by Jury. He was the brother of its composer, Arthur Sullivan. Fred's performance would provide a model for comic roles in later Savoy operas. His stage career only lasted a few years, however, due to ill health. He died from liver disease and tuberculosis at just 39. His brother composed the song the last chord at Fred's bedside as he lay dying, and is dedicated to his memory. Here's one for you football fans, or soccer fans. This is the grave of businessman Gus Mears. In 1896 he and his brother purchased Stamford Bridge Athletic Ground and the Market Garden, with the intent on making it the preeminent football ground for high profile matches. Unable to convince Fulham to relocate their club to his new grounds, he decided to found his own team. In 1905 he formed the Chelsea Football Club. The club competes in the Premier League and over the decades has won numerous honours and competitions, including the FIFA Club World title in 2021. Gus Mears was just 38 when he died in 1912. Our next notable figure here rests quietly in an unmarked grave. Here lies James Bohe. James and his brother George were a Canadian musical duo of Caribbean descent. They played banjo and had their own minstrel show in the late 1800s. They toured the US and later London and Europe. Their show was described as exciting to watch with their virtuosic banjo playing and dancing. They wrote many of their own songs, their repertoire including songs from sentimental to anti-slavery. This introduced European audiences to black American heritage in the 19th century. James decided to stay in London, where he was lauded for his prowess on the banjo as the Paganini of the banjo. He offered instruction on the instrument, his most notable pupil being the Prince of Wales, who would become King Edward VII. James died in 1897 at age 53. This grave marks the Lambert family. There's a lot of talent in this grave plot, among them Constant Lambert. At the age of 20 he became the youngest composer to receive a commission from the Ballet Russe. He would be catapulted into fame with his jazz-influenced cantata, The Rio Grande, in 1928. 
Years later he would co-found the Vic Wells Ballet, now England's Royal Ballet. He would serve as its artistic director and conductor until 1947. He died at just 45 from pneumonia and diabetes complications from alcoholism. He's buried here with his father George, who was a noted painter and sculptor. Also here is his brother Maurice, who like his father became a noted sculptor in London. And in 1981, Constant was joined in the grave by his son Christopher, known as Kit Lambert. A name familiar to you fans of the rock band The Who, Kit began his career in film working as an assistant director on films like The Guns of Navarone. He found his way to the popular music scene filming for a music group called The High Numbers. The band would later become known as The Who, and Lambert would become the group's manager and producer. Along with colleague Chris Stamp, they founded their own record label in 1967, Track Records, which would also sign talents like Jimi Hendrix. The Who cut ties with Lambert in 1974. Kit died in 1981 from head injuries after suffering a fall following a night of heavy drinking. He was 45. Next up here is another scientist by the name of Sir William Crookes, an English chemist and physicist. He was a pioneer of vacuum tubes, inventing the Crookes tube in 1875. It was an early cathode ray tube which would help in the discovery of electrons. Cathode ray tubes would also lead to the invention of the television decades later. Crookes is also credited for discovering the element thallium in 1861, and he created a lens that blocked UV light in 1913. Very handy on sunny days in the cemetery. William Crookes lived to be 86. Strolling along the path next to the wall, we arrive at the grave of a man named William Terrace. He was an actor of the Victorian era, known particularly for swashbuckling roles like Robin Hood. He was also known for performing the works of Shakespeare. As a hero of the melodramas at the Adelphi Theatre, he'd become one of Britain's most popular actors of the era. But in 1897, William was stabbed to death by a deranged actor at the stage door of the Adelphi Theatre, where he was appearing. He was 50. The ghost of William Terrace is now said to haunt the Covent Garden tube station, and the Adelphi Theatre where he was killed. Here next to the road in front of the main entrance we arrive at the grave of Emmeline Pankhurst. She was one of the preeminent figures of women's suffrage in the 20th century, which fought to give women the right to vote. In the first decade of the 20th century she organized campaigns for women's rights, which led to her imprisonment in 1908, and subsequently in 1912 and 1913. Finally, in 1918, the right to vote in Great Britain and Ireland was extended to women over 30. Then in 1928, Parliament passed an act which lowered the age limit to 21. But Emmeline died just weeks before the passage at the age of 69. She'd be honored with a statue in Victoria Tower Gardens, and was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Important People of the 20th Century. Our last Brompton stop brings us to the section along the Western Wall. Here lies Brian Glover, a wrestler, actor, and writer. He began his career as a professional wrestler under the moniker Leon Eris, the Man from Paris. He then made his way into acting, appearing in films like Kess, An American Werewolf in London, and Alien 3. Brian was known for playing gruff but likable characters on screen. He'd make numerous appearances on British television as well, in shows like Coronation Street, Porridge, Doctor Who, Campion, and more. He died from a brain tumor at age 63. The last cemetery of the day is another of London's magnificent seven cemeteries, one of the most grand and star-studded in the London area, Highgate Cemetery. We're joined here at Highgate by a friendly fox. Be sure to check out our other videos of stars we've found here at Highgate in previous visits. First up here we find the grave of Frank Hall. He was a distinguished painter of the Victorian era, highly sought after for portraits of the aristocracy. His notable portraits include Lord Roberts, the Prince of Wales, and W.S. Gilbert. He was also known for his sentimental narrative paintings of Victorian life, known as social realism. Frank was just 43 when he died in 1888. And finally, we find the grave of a true icon of 80s popular music, George Michael. 
We featured him in a previous video, but at the time his grave was unmarked. Since that time this new marker has been placed for him. George Michael rose to fame as half of 80s pop duo Wham! with Andrew Ridgely. Their hits include Careless Whisper, and Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go. George Michael later embarked on a solo career, and would become one of the best-selling artists of all time with hits like Freedom 90 and Faith. George's music would become the soundtrack to the lives of millions in the 80s. He would use his wealth and fame for many philanthropic causes. After coming out as gay, he actively promoted LGBTQ rights, raised funds for AIDS research, and donated millions to various charities throughout his life, often anonymously. Another of his hits with Wham! was Last Christmas. The song would take on a tragic new meaning after George Michael died early on Christmas morning in 2016. At just 53, his death shocked and saddened the world, the tragedy compounded by a lack of understanding of just how he died. The cause of death was eventually listed as natural causes as a result of heart disease and a fatty liver. He was laid to rest here with his mother and sister, who also died on Christmas Day. He's buried under his birth name, Georgios Kyriakos Panayotou. And that concludes our tour. What are some of your favorite memories of the stars we visited today? Share them in the comments below, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more famous grave tours. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.